choice in life, right? We either fight for ourselves or we allow the Lord to fight for us. Now, I've learned one thing. I've lived long enough. When you try to battle, all right, yourself and your own energy, your own strength, you get mighty, mighty what? Tired, exhausted, discouraged, all right? But when you allow Him, all right, to fight for you, to battle for you, you experience that deliverance that we spoke of. And praise God for those songs. Thank you, Jason and the team. If you have your Bibles or you can turn to your app, I want you to turn this morning, Genesis chapter 32. Genesis chapter 32. I want to speak this morning on lessons learned in the face of fear. Now, I know, you know, today in the times we live, there's uh, nothing to fear about. I mean, all the news that you hear, whether, uh, you know, on television or radio, you tune in on your, uh, you know, device, is all positive, right? How things are bright, in other words, the sun's going to be shining tomorrow. No, all right? And I, I would say this. That fear is something that all of us are very familiar with. And it has been with mankind, all right, since the fall. Remember Adam? Hiding from God because God is. Why are you hiding? Because I am what? Afraid, all right? It's been around a very long time. It takes many, many different forms. Now, I was thinking about this, and I'm going to, I, Diane put up uh, a couple of pictures, all right? I was thinking about things that I, experience how I experienced fear all right in my life and I put some of them down hydrophobia fear of what war uh, I graduated in high school Abingdon senior high school outside of Philadelphia and to graduate from that high school you had to be able to swim if you couldn't swim you didn't graduate seriously unless you had a doctor's excuse all right I still remember we ha we would have these swimming teachers they were all right the gym teachers now, if you were in my age group, if you remember what gym teachers were like, a lot of them were very sadistic. <laughs> all, right, all right. All right. Here's how they introduced the swim class, all right, is that you'd have a lot of these kids, well, I can't swim. Oh, that's okay. And they would have them a long line on the deep end at the diving board and would make them go out to the edge of the diving board the gym teacher would have that long, I don't know what the apparatus is called, long pole with a hook on the end. Jump. <laughs> and force them to jump. Boy, you talk about fear, right? And then he would allow them to go to the bottom, then scoop them up, all right? Fear water, all right? So I remember that, all right? This is, you know, the good old days back in the 60s, all right? Then there's nycophobia. That's the fear. Anybody know what that is? The fear of the dark, all right? <laughs> I was familiar with this. One of my big outreaches when I was uh, involved in bus ministry children's pastor was, uh, uh, again, during Halloween. And I would uh, get a farmer to donate uh, land for that night, and we would make a trail of fear. I guess I was like that gym teacher, right? <laughs> As I would bus in, you know, it was about 700 kids, right? And a lot of these kids were familiar with farm area. And I would cut this path through the woods and make certain scenes, and we, there was no lights. So I would take a length of rope, and we'd have them lead them through. And I would, you know, tell them, you hold on to that rope for dear life. <laughs> these the th third graders, right? You leave go of that rope. We're never finding you. <laughs> All right? And, uh, man, it's like, and then they would eventually come out to a giant bonfire and everything else. But so you're not too hard on me. Once the kids came out, they would, you know kids, right? You know what they would ask me? Can I do it again? Can I do it again, right? But fear of the dark. Then there's uh, uh, acrophobia, fear of high places. Ooh, uh, some of you went to with me to Ghana. All right, Jen, remember that rope bridge? Oh, man, I do not like heights. I remember I was, oh, I was over a canopy, very high, very, I forget. Probably it was at least 100 feet down, all right? And uh, you're going across. Basically, it was a ladder, all right, that was there with a couple boards thrown over it, very long, all right, with ropes holding it up, right? So my buddy, Ken, he was ahead of me. He gets to the end of the bridge. What does he do for Pastor Bill? Woo! <laughs> Starts swinging it back and forth. And I'm holding on for dear life. So 
All right, fear of high places. Then there's ophidiophobia. I'm probably pronouncing it wrong. Fear of snakes. All right, I don't know if any of you've seen any of those out this year. Right, the black snake and the copperheads. Then um, Diane likes this one. Acrophobia, uh, arachnophobia. All right, fear of spiders. All right, and uh, a lot of people familiar with that. Then there was one uh, necrophobia. All right, I have friends who were funeral directors. In fact, I had a close friend, Bob McGovern. He lived on top of the funeral home, all right? And he would, when you visit him, he would take you to the basement, all right? Where the, where the bodies were being prepared. And a lot of folks, you know, you know, fear of their bodies. Came across this little joke, and I like this, all right? There was a passenger in a taxi, all right? He, he, was, he was being uh, driven in the city. And uh, he leaned over to ask the driver a question and gently, you know, tap, tapped him on the shoulder to get his attention. Well, the driver ended up screaming, lost control of the cab, nearly hit a bus, drove over the curb, stopped short, all right, of a store window. For a few minutes, you know, everything's silent in the cab. Then the shaking, you know, a driver turns around and asks, are you okay? I'm so sorry, but you scared the daylights out of me. The barely shaking passenger apologized to the driver. He says, I didn't realize, you know, a mere tap on your shoulder would startle somebody so bad. And the cab driver said, no, no, it's I'm who should be sorry. Entirely my fault. First day driving a cab, first passenger. I've been driving a hearse for 25 years. <laughs> oh, baby, right? <laughs> so, so the fear of the dead. And then Diane came with this. We can associate with this today. Agoraphobia. Does anybody know what that is? Fear of crowds. Agoraphobia. Fear of crowds. Places that make you feel vulnerable. Right? Anybody, you know, that, that's going on today. But there's so many different kinds of fear, all right? And one fear, another one I have down here is taking over the world, germophobia, all right? Oh, that's out there, all right? And again, that's the fear of microorganisms that might cause disease, right? And so that has a picture, you might remember that, all right? So a lot of fears, all right? Now, what one person is afraid of, another person might what? not be afraid of it's very individually but there are circumstances in life which we all have the tendency really to succumb to fear or at least the vast majority all right and we're in the midst of one of those times and as, as i was thinking about this i would classify it as chronophobia now chronophobia is the fear of the future chronophobia fear of the future all right and here's a couple things i wrote down as i talk to people People worry, will I get the virus? And if I get the virus, will I die? All right, will I recover? Will my family get the virus? Will my family recover? Uh, some of the, well, is our country about ready to implode? Am I going to lose my freedoms? Are my children going to grow up in a country that is uh, antagonistic to Christianity? Uh, some folks in business will go, will I recover financially all right, from everything that has happened? Uh, some, you know, I, and I have my family, kids that, you know, went through college and you finally get them through, you take all those loans, but now they have no what? Job and they're living in the basement, all right? And they're thinking, will my child ever get a, get a job, all right? Uh, I see this every time I, I'm out by us as Fuquay Gun and Gold. There's always a long line, all right, to get in that place, all right, to fear, do I need to buy a gun, all right, to be safe. And then the last one, but do I need, all right, or will I be able to buy toilet paper, right? <laughs> Anybody beside me have a stock <laughs> upstairs? There's something about this time, I'm not able to go past a display of toilet paper without buying some, <laughs> right? And so... But there's a fear, you know, uh, again, will I be able to buy food or toilet paper? Now, as Christians, I personally believe that God would have us to confront our fears and not be controlled by them. Fear is something that's real, all right? All of us experience different ways, all right? Kidding around. But I believe, all right, the message to the Word of God is I am not to be controlled by my fears, but I am to confront them. In fact, I'll, I'll tell you this, the Lord often allows us to be put in the midst of our greatest fear in order to learn life's greatest lessons. 
See, we really don't learn many lessons on the mountaintop. God understands that. And he'll put us in some dark, scary places and times where we're going to learn some lessons we could not learn, all right, any other place or in any other way. And a good example of that is going to be in Genesis chapter 32 with a man by the name of Jacob. Now, before I read those verses, let me give you a little background. Jacob is heading home, all right? He's been going for about 20 years. He's going back to the land of his birth, all right? He has been living with his uncle, his mother's brother. He left alone when he went there. He was a bachelor, but now he has two wives, has 11 kids, has great herds, and God has blessed him. He's, he's a wealthy man, all right? And, and by the way, the decision to go back home is not his decision. God has directed him to go back home. Problem is, Jacob has a history. Jacob has a past, all right? He has a history of deception. He has deceived other people all of his life. And he used other people to get what he wanted and to come out on top. He has a history of weakness. Constantly would give in, all right, to his self-centered, fleshly desire. In other words, life was always about, about who? Jacob, right? And Jacob would use other people, all right, to satisfy whatever his desires and to accomplish whatever his goals were. And then he had a history of failure. I mean, he constantly refused to trust who? Trust God. His trust was in himself, all right? And his schemes, his plans, how he was able to manipulate things. Now, after 20 years, God has directed him, all right, to come face to face with one of the people that he deceived and took advantage of. And if you know the story, that was his brother. And his brother was a man by the name of Esau, all right? Uh, Jacob had deceived his father Jacob, all right, stealing the birthright that was Esau's. And Esau promised, next time I see you, I'm killing you. And by the way, Esau was a man's man, all right? Uh, again, if you understand here uh, about where Jacob, he was a uh, mama's boy, all right? And uh, Esau says, when I see you, boy, I'm going to strangle the life right out of you, all right? And God ended up, all right, directed him that he would have to go back and to face Esau. Now, remember, he hasn't seen Esau for 20 years. This is his brother. He hasn't talked to Esau for 20 years. And God says, guess what? I've arranged a family reunion for you, all right? You're going back home, and you're going to meet your brother uh, Esau. He has Jacob face his what? Greatest fear. Because Jacob knew he deceived Esau and his plan in his brain was, I'll never have to see him again. I'll never have to face him. All right? In other words, we'll never see each other again. But now he is told to face Esau and to face his past. And on the way home to make matters even worse, all right, he's, he's doing what God tells him to do, but he hears somebody comes, well, Esau's coming to meet you. Oh, okay. But he has 400 armed men with him. <laughs> right. I mean, now think about that if, if you were Jacob. In his mind, he's thinking what? This is it, babe. <laughs> right? he, he, he's he's going to kill me. He's going to take everything out. Fear is overwhelming him. He's afraid and he's distressed. In fact, if you look in verse 7 of chapter 32, it says this, And Jacob was greatly afraid greatly distressed and he divided the people that were with him and the flocks and herds camels into two companies and he says if Esau comes to one company and attacks it then the other company which is left will escape here's his plan all right of course he had more than one wife all right so he favored all right a certain wife favored certain kids so he would put the wife really loved the least well you be out front honey with your kids all right and then his other wife, well, you be second. By the way, guess who was holding up the rear? That was Jacob, right? <laughs> so they get first two companies and at least that, is, that he'd be able to escape. In other words, again, he's coming up with a what? A scheme. I can't trust God, right? He put me in this situation. So he comes up with this plan. And then if you read verse 13 to 21, he even sends all these gifts to Esau. I mean, one gift after another, herds and things of great value he's giving his brother, right? Now he's ready to cross the river. 
But he's grabbed in the story by the angel of the Lord. And by the way, many believe this is a personification of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And it's time for Jacob. He got to learn some lessons, all right? He's put in a situation he's facing his greatest fear. But before it's going to happen, he has to learn some lessons. And keeping this in mind, let me read starting verse 22 of chapter 32 of the book of Genesis. And it says, He, Jacob, arose that night, and he took his two wives, his two female servants, the eleven sons, and he crossed over the ford of the Jordan. And he took them and sent them over the brook and sent over what he had. Then Jacob was left alone. And a man, by the way, if you're reading in the Bible, you see it's capital M, all right? It's talking about divine personification, all right? Wrestled with him unto the breaking of day. Now when he, speaking the angel of the Lord, saw that he did not prevail against him, he touched the socket of Jacob's hip, and the socket of Jacob's hip was out of joint, and he wrestled with him. Anybody ever have a hip or shoulder go out of joint? That's a lot of pain, all right? And you know what you have here? Jacob, in the midst of that pain, still would not what? Still would not let go, all right? And it says, he said, all right, the angel of the Lord, let me go because day breaks. But he said, Jacob saying, I will not let you go unless you bless me. I need your blessing. I need your anointing. So he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. And he said, your name will no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have struggled with God and with men and have prevailed. Then Jacob asked, saying, tell me your name, I pray. And he said, why is it that you ask my name? And he blessed him there. So Jacob called the name of the place Peniel, for I have seen God face to face, and my life is preserved. Just as he crossed over Peniel, the sun arose, and it says he, Jacob, limped on his hip. Therefore, to this day, the children of Israel do not eat the muscle that shrank, which is on the hip socket, because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip in the muscle that shrank. Will you join me as we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, I pray, dear Lord, now, as we look in your word, that you would help us that we would learn, dear Lord, acknowledge the same lessons that Jacob learned these many thousand years ago. We are prone to be like Jacob. We are prone to trust ourselves instead of trusting you. We are prone to come up with our own plans, our own schemes, dear Lord, to accomplish our own ends. We are prone to do the opposite that we sung about. Instead of allowing you to battle for us, instead of allowing you to be Lord and God, dear Lord, we take that responsibility ourselves. So I pray, dear Lord, that lessons that Jacob learned that day had turned his life around will be lessons that we acknowledge and learn this day. For I pray in Jesus' most precious name. Amen. Let me give you three lessons God had to teach Jacob. And I think three lessons that we need to understand and learn in the times of which we are in. Number one is the lesson of dependence. All right, not independence. The lesson of dependence. See, Jacob had a history, all right, of fighting God for control of his life. If you went to Jacob and you said, you believe in God? Yes, I believe in God. Do you trust God? Yes, I trust God. Do you have faith in God? Yes, I have faith in God. But time and time again, no matter what situation it was, Jacob always fought against God so that he could control his life. He thought he knew better than God. All right? And he fought for that control. He felt he could not lean on God alone. He felt he could not cast all of his dependence on God, giving God total control. He had to be involved. In other words, he had to have his hands on his life. All right? And as a smart man, Jacob was a very smart man. As a smart man, he developed a lifestyle of dependence. He could come up with plans. I mean, I mean he could just take any situation... All right? And turn it around for his own betterment, his own good. Right? And it, it, it almost he was developing a lifestyle, I don't need God. I can work this thing out on my own. He would lean on his own cunning. He was lean on his own schemes. He became a self-reliant or a self-dependent uh, man. Now, in the times of crisis, 
We also many times take that path. We rely on what we can do, all right? Uh, we rely on our sufficiency. Very dangerous. In fact, this is the world we live in. I don't know if you're, and I'm sure most of you heard the governor of New York when, and from that area when he gave a press conference, he was, uh, when the numbers were coming down, and said, God had nothing to do with this. I did it. God did not do it. You know, maybe we wouldn't as blatantly say that, but that's the lifestyle. In other words, by my schemes, by my cunning, by my design, I can accomplish my ends. All right? I can take control of my life. That's who Jacob was. But to be the man of God that God intended for Jacob, Jacob had to openly admit, all right, that he needed God's anointing and he needed God's blessing, God's grace upon him. Now, that's hard for a man who is self-reliant, all right, man or woman, all right, that ends up thinks that, you know, I can control things. I need to be in control, all right, to get you to the point that you admit, I have to have God, and if I don't have God in my life, and I'm talking right here and now, in other words, I perish. And God was going to bring Jacob to that point. He needed to openly acknowledge, Jacob, that his plans and schemes weren't enough. You can scheme, you can plan, you can do everything you want, but it's not enough. He needed to learn the same lesson the Apostle Paul learned. Like Jacob, Paul was a brilliant man, all right? Many talents, many abilities. But he had to learn from God, 2 Corinthians chapter 12, what? My grace, God's grace, is sufficient, all right, for you, for my strength is made perfect, in weakness. And whose weakness was he talking about? He was talking about Paul's weakness. And see, Jacob had to understand that. In the scheme of things, all right, Jacob, you are weak. You are not in control. Your efforts are all feeble. I am in control. And you need to put your dependence upon me and allow me to battle for you. And that's what was going to happen this night. Jacob had to come to that point that he would acknowledge this. So God, all right, ended up struggling with Jacob. By the way, it was a fixed fight. You understand what I'm saying? In other words, I mean, the, the angel of the Lord could have won the fight just like that, all right? But it wasn't about the battle. It was bringing Jacob to the end of himself. There's a verse in Hosea that says this, Hosea 12, 3. It says, in his strength, Jacob struggled with God. Wouldn't that describe a lot of us, right? <laughs> in our strength, we're going to struggle. You sure you want me to do that? I don't know if I can really, you know, do that, trust God in this situation. We struggle. And Jacob struggled with God. And as we read the verses, finally at dawn, as dawn begins to break, Jacob's worn out. And he cries out, I will not let you go. I can't let you go unless you bless me. I'm not ready to face Esau. I'm not ready to face this day. My scheme and my plan is insufficient. In other words, I need you. And if I don't have you, in other words, I'm undone. And he would not let him go. I need your blessing or else I perish this day. My strength and my schemes are not enough. I can only understand life, you know, for a man, all right, being a man. But it's hard to bring us men to that point to end up saying, I'm not enough. I can't handle this. In other words, no matter what I do, no matter what scheme I come up with, in other words, it's not going to be enough. I'm going to perish in the light of that need. And uh, this is where Jacob had to come to. And Jacob would carry a reminder of that encounter all of his life. Because in verse 31, it says that Jacob, he did what after that encounter? He limped. All the rest of his life. Every step that, J again, if you have pro I've been having, you know, knee problem, back problem. And when you get uh, problems with your joints, every step you make sort of reminds you, I'm in pain. Am I right? Every step Jacob took reminded him of that night. Reminded him, all right, I need God. And uh, there's a verse in Hebrews chapter 11, 21 says, Jacob, for the rest of his years, worshiped God, leaning on his staff. 
he remembered, I have to lean upon God, not lean upon myself. Boy, if we aren't in the exact same situation, right? I mean, I listen to all the news, and I, and I understand we're in a pandemic, uh, man, wear the mask and do everything. We, we socially distance ourselves, except for being here in church, all right? And, uh, but again, we need to understand, all right, that even with all those efforts, you listen to stuff and so many conflicting messages. What do I exactly do that's going to guarantee me 100% safety in all this? Folks, can I say, we do, you do what you can, but your leaning and your dependence has to be upon God. You're responsible as an individual, all right? Certain things we need to do. But your safety and my safety, your life and my life, is in the hands of Almighty God, all right? I needed to be dependent upon him. See, God had to bring Jacob that he would live a lifestyle of leaning and not scheming. See, we have this tendency, we scheme our lives, right? If I do this, this, and this, everything's going to come out. Can I say, you can do this, 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 and this, and it might not come out like you think. Do you understand? You can wear a mask, you can socially isolate, you can do everything. You still might come with this virus. We understand that, right? My life is in the hands of God. Now, again, I'm still saying, say, be responsible. But I'm saying God's called me. I'm leaning on him. My life is in his hands. All right? He had, Jacob had to learn. He's been independent all of his life. And now he had to learn, I need to be dependent upon my God. You know what he found out, though? God's enough. <laughs> God's sufficient. See, the only way you and I will ever have peace in times like this, and this will not be the worst of times this country and this world is going to face, it will only come when we realize, you know, my God's enough. My God's sufficient for me. He'll work all things together for good. So we had to learn the lesson, all right, depend. Second thing, he had to learn the lesson of identity. The lesson of identity. It's very interesting in this wrestling match, in verse 27, the angel of the Lord asked him a question. What's your name? All right, now, again, he's not asking the question for information. The angel of the Lord already knows what his name is. But he wants to hear Jacob, all right, response in who he, how he sees himself, who he sees himself as. So in verse 27, he asks, what is your name? Who are you? And that's a question all of us need to be able to answer. Sometimes people, you know, have a problem doing this. Sometimes we'll describe ourselves by what we do. Well, I'm a financial planner, or I'm a pastor, or I'm this. No, who are you? All right? That's what he's asking Jacob, all right? Who are you? And notice Jacob's answer. He says, they call me what? Jacob. Now, understand, back in Bible times, when they gave a person a name, if you understand Jacob, he saw twins, and if you know of their birth, all right, Jacob was named Jacob. That word means what? Surplanter or trickster, all right? That guy, that man, he has, you know, tricks up his sleeve, right? He's able to get one over on you, come out on top all the time. And so literally, he's saying, they call me trickster. They call me schemer. And that's how he saw himself. He accepted the label and he acted on how other people saw him and what other people told him about his identity. All right? I'm trickster. His whole life was tricking people. His whole life was scheming. Question always comes, how do you see yourself this morning? How do you see yourself in the midst of everything that's going on in this world? You know, the, the world's mess, you're, you know, words, you're, a, you're a victim, all right? In other words, uh, you're, you're, you're vulnerable, all right? And, and you have people that are just are, are fearful. I mean, you, whether in the grocery store or wherever you're at, I mean, it's, it's like, it's a sort of Damocles, like hanging over their head in fear, all right? We are prone, speaking about identity, probably to go one of three directions. Sometimes you have people that see themselves through the eyes of other people. We allow other people to label us. Who are you? All right? 
And, and, and you remember this. Again, I remember more, you know, I guess my generation went to school. You would have teachers that would tell you, you can't do this. I still remember that uh, uh, my dad had a dream that I was going to play the clarinet. Yeah, it was never going to happen, right? But anyhow, elementary school back then, they signed you an instrument, right? And so I got signed to clarinet and try as try Bill would. <laughs> I can never master this. So when they, when they would have, you know, their, you know, the, the performances, elementary school, I'd be in the back, back row. <laughs> it wasn't first, second, third, it was back. And I would be, but I wasn't blowing into the <laughs> All right. I still remember when the teacher said, Bill, don't be discouraged. Some people are able, some people can't. And you can't. <laughs> and I remember me in fifth grade. Yeah. All <laughs> right. And gave him that clarinet because you, the school gave him to you, right? And going home, where's your clarinet, dad is? No, I, hey, teacher said I don't have it, dad, right? But, <laughs> and, but I accepted that, right? You're not musical. You know, you know what people tell kids? You can't do math, you can't do science, you can't do this, right? Uh, at home, you know, where it's uh, uh, mistakes people can make, call your kid dummy and all these other things. Jacob says they call me schemer, all right? Others say it, must be true, all right? Uh, sometimes people see themselves through their own eyes, all right? We compare ourselves to others who are more gifted, right? Like, uh, man, it's like, I love playing golf. Never got really any good at it, but I played with people who were good. The most humiliating thing is when, I still remember at an exclusive club up in New York, all of a sudden they, they paired us with a 12-year-old boy. You know how humiliating it is to be a grown man and play with a 12-year-old boy that shoots par? It's like, <laughs> you just kept on getting worse, right? But we, we start comparing ourselves. What went wrong, right? Well, Jacob compared himself to his brother Esau. Esau, man, was this hairy guy, man, muscles, I mean, a hunter, everything else. And Jacob looking in, 125 pounds, right? Mama says, I love you, all right? So he was co <laughs> comparing, and, he, and he just, so Jacob had to use his what? Use your wit, use your brain, all right, to get ahead. But a lot of people do this, don't we? We compare ourselves to other people. By the way, all of us are unique, right? God never wants me to compare myself with somebody else. I'm the person who God created to be, and I'm created that way to give him honor and glory. Sometimes we see ourselves through past history, through our deeds. Jacob had a history of scheming, deceived his own brother. So he ends up saying, well, I've done all these things, therefore that's who I am. Here's the question this morning, all right? Because Jacob had to see himself how God saw him, all right? How am I to see myself in the midst of this time. See, am I to see myself as a victim? Somebody that really is, is vulnerable and fear? No, I need to see myself through God's eyes. That's what God was telling Jacob. He tells Jacob in verse 28, your name is no longer going to be Jacob, but your name is going to be Israel, which means what? Prince with God. You have a special relationship with with me and he's literally telling Jacob you need to start seeing yourself as I see you you need to see yourself as I now the question is that how do you see yourself let me give you some verses you know to read on your own but here's what I need to accept what God tells me all right forget about what everybody else I mean you can have an opinion that's great but I'm going to only my creator can tell me as his creation who I am, all right? And you know what he tells us in the book of Ephesians? He says, I need to understand if you're a believer here this morning, put your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, you're a child of God. You are a child of the living, omnipotent God. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 to 7, have in predestined us to the adoption of sons by Jesus Christ to himself. You can read verses 5 to 7. Literally what it's saying, God chose you to be in his family think of that for a second now when you have children you, in other words and you go to the hospital right like when you have kids right and they bring out the old like they didn't bring up three boys and say which one do you want right 
it wasn't more you you had to accept <laughs> the boy that came from all right from your union right now think about this all right god chose us all right in other words that it, it's like it's it's not that i was worthy to be born in his family or that he was stuck with me <laughs> right he chose me he chose to extend his grace towards me i don't deserve it but he, he predestined i can't even understand that i can't understand you ever see annie right in the orphanage and the and the people go in to choose kids can you imagine you in a line of people around the world and god says, i choose you i'd be going who's he pointing to right it's like but this is the truth of it I'm a child of God by the grace of God. I, I need to see myself as God sees me. But not only am I a child of God, it says in Ephesians chapter 1, I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. Verse 11, In Him also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of Him who works all things. In other words, God, has an, God Almighty has an inheritance for me. Can I say it? Inheritance is no good unless I survive long enough to get the inheritance, right? What would it matter if I was coming into a vast inheritance and I died before I received it, right? God has an inheritance for you and I. He's going to preserve us that we receive that inheritance. I, I understand that, man, I'm not a beggar. I'm a child of God and I have inherited. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. I need to accept what God says about me. And as you do that, what happens? It ignites your faith and gives you peace. All of a sudden, Jacob, he's ready to go out and to face who? He's ready to face his brother. Right? I'm a prince with God. Understand who you are. When you get up and look in the morning, it's not because of who we are, but the grace of God. I'm a child of God. I'm a joint heir with Jesus Christ. But also the last thing, he had to learn the lesson of communion. The lesson of communion. If you look in verse 30, all right, as the day broke, Jacob called the name of that place Peniel. And Peniel literally means face of God. Jacob's life was changed by an intimate face-to-face -face encounter with God. Isn't that what he had? Same thing that happened to Moses, right? See, if we're to conquer our fears, we not only need to learn the lesson of dependence and identity, I need God's touch, God, if I can say God's daily touch and God's daily anointing on my life. I need the lesson of communion. Jacob had an encounter with God before. If you go back to Genesis chapter 28, don't got time to read it. Remember when he was leaving home? Remember he saw the ladder ascending up to heaven? All right? And you can read about that encounter. That's 20 years ago. You know the problem with most of us as Christians? We're trying to live on an experience 20 years ago or years ago and living the Christian life today can't be done. It literally cannot be done. You cannot live the Christian life today on grace that you received years ago. I need God's fresh grace. I need a fresh encounter with God each and every day. This is what Jacob needed to understand. He could not live off yesterday's grace. And what was true for Jacob is true for me. I thank God for past encounters with God. What God has done in our life. How God has touched our life. How God has blessed us. But again, that's not enough to get through today. I need that fresh encounter with God. I need to see. Look at verse 30 what it says. Jacob, old name Peniel. I have seen God face to face. And I'll be honest with you. I need to see the face of God each and every day. I need to see the face of God. I need to have an encounter with God. I can't live off what you tell me or somebody, a preacher tells me. I have to have an encounter with God. I need to know the reason for my faith. How do you do that? Uh, I'll give you this verse in second, because I ran out of Second Corinthians chapter 3. Listen to what Paul says to the Corinth church. Probably a verse we've heard many times. It says, we all with unveiled face, that means there's nothing between us and God, beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord, are transformed in the same image from glory to glory, 
just by the Spirit of the Lord. Really kind of an analogy or a story going back to Moses as he went up to the mount. And when he would come down, his face would be a glow because he was in the glory of God. And people could not look at him. He had to veil his face. All right? And it's saying, talking about here that God wants to touch you and I through his word as ministered by the Holy Spirit. But we got to stay into his, in his presence. The final one I'm going to say, I'll end with this. Moses was on that mount 40 days and 40 nights. And when he came back, his face was aglow. See, what I want to do is take my Bible, daily bread, read two verses, read a devotion in three minutes, and I've seen the face of God. It doesn't happen that way, folks. It literally doesn't happen that way. Study. I mean, I, I remember Dwight Moody. If you ever heard of Dwight Moody, he was a great evangelist. Uh, and um, he worked with street kids in Chicago. Great ministry. Moody Bible Institute still there and, and all of his ministries. And he had great success. He was a great um, organizer. He started what, you know, again, like Sunday schools for those kids. And he had people getting saved and everything else. But there was two women, two older women, that prayed for him that he would have anointing from God. And they got him to pray with her. And he gives his testimony. One day he was walking on the street, all right? And he was overwhelmed by the presence of God. Went to a friend's house that lived nearby in a room and was there for the rest of the hour upon hour. And when he left that place, it talks about his ministry literally imploded. Where he would usually have two decisions, all of a sudden there was hundreds of thousands of people going forward. It was like, so. It, it, he literally was talking about that he had the anointing of God. He said, I can't go on like this. I need you. And you find stories like this over and over. Jonathan Edwards, the first great awakening of our country. How we drew a circle and got in a circle said, I'm not leaving a circle. Unless you get a hold of my life. Because you will not rock this nation. You will not change this world until you first change me. And then, see, that's what happened to Jacob. He had a personal encounter with God. He said, I... I'm not going to settle, all right, for barren routine, <laughs> you know, Christianity. Now, we're in this crisis. I think we need to learn the same lessons. And God has allowed us to enter this for a reason, right? I believe he allowed us to enter that we would understand we can depend upon him. Oh, sure, it's real. Sure, it can be frightening. But you know what? I got a God that's bigger than any virus out there. We need to know the lesson of identity. I'm a child of God. And as his child and a joint heir with Jesus Christ, I'm not living in vulnerability. I'm living in not with a life of grace. And then we need to have communion. If I'm to understand that, I need to get in his presence each and every day. You know, it's like, again, you're probably like me. I got masks everywhere. <laughs> All right? I mean, in my car. I got multiple masks. I give you a mask, right? Everywhere I got. My kids give me masks, right? And, but it's like that I have to have them, all right? And aren't we like that? And hand sanitizer and everything. Are we that way? So I have to have God. <laughs> I have to hear from him each and every day. Is that more important than a mask? Yes. That's what God wants. It put us in this time that we would learn that. And Jacob, all of a sudden, God's enough. I don't know what the next day is going to bring. I don't know what the next step is going to bring. But God's with me. Let's have every head bowed and every eye closed. Nobody looking around. I don't know what you've been dealing with this time, but I'm sure you're like me. So many different things in your life dealing with in this time. The world tells you how vulnerable you are, how close to death that we are. But we need to understand the same lessons Jacob had to learn. That we can depend upon God, that you're his child, and that we need to see his face each and every day. But maybe you need here, just to, at this altar this morning, just like Jacob said, you know, well, I'm not going to leave you unless you bless me. Maybe you need to come at this altar and literally tell the Lord that you need him in a certain area of your life. And that you would ask for his blessing and his anointing. I'm going to ask that we'd all stand, heads bowed, eyes closed, nobody looking around, everyone standing. This can become routine, but we're going to have the music team, the praise team, they're going to put, do a song. 
But maybe this morning you need to get a hold of God. Maybe you need to wrestle with him and tell him, I can't leave this place unless I know you're with me. But whatever you need is this morning, allow him to have his way.